first of all, um, I'll do a quick introduction. I'll then be handing over to uh, Dara from Energy UK, um, then to Tina from Oxford University, and finally over to uh, Leah, um, who runs an installation firm called Your Energy UK. OK, so the purpose of this afternoon's webinar is to think about the role of heat pumps, heat pumps and how we can achieve um, the best consumer outcomes when they're installed. Um, as I say, I work for an organisation called the Regulatory Assistance Project, but this webinar is part of the UK Energy Research Centre, which is one of the UK's um, leading research centres um, on clean energy and on the energy transition. Um, a quick introduction from me will be followed by uh, three short um, talks or presentations from our wonderful guest speakers, um, and there will be time for open discussion um, at the end. Um, it's quite an informal session, so I'm not sure that everyone will be, will be speaking for the full 10 minutes. Um, not everyone has slides, um, but some of us do. So first of all, um, it's becoming increasingly obvious that heat pumps have to be a huge part of our energy future. Um, even I think before the um, war in Ukraine and the gas price crisis, there was a, an understanding that they would have an extremely important part in the UK's and even the world's energy mix. Um, but increasingly we're seeing the value of heat pumps and um, because of their overall efficiency and because of the impact that they can have in reducing both fossil fuel use um, and emissions. Um, and there are two uh, graphs on this slide, both from the Commission on Climate Change's sixth carbon budget reports um, that show quite clearly the scale of both the challenge, but also the scale of the opportunity. Um, so the graph on the left hand side here shows the expected uptake, the total number of heat pumps um, in buildings under the Commission on Climate Change's uh, balanced scenario. And this is a scenario that takes into account various energy system impacts um, and costs as well. Um, and what the graph really shows is that um, heat pumps go from today's very low levels to being a dominant technology in 2050. Um, dominant uh, very much in new builds, so the vast majority of new build homes being fitted with heat pumps. But even in existing homes, um, around well over 20 million existing um, homes being converted to heat pumps by 2050. Um, and this is the scenario that the CCC thinks is the most pragma pragmatic um, and the most cost effective as well. Um, and the scale of this growth is really staggering. Um, heat pumps will be taking up almost as big a role as gas boilers in homes um, in 2050 as they do today, not quite as much, but um, that sort of level. Um, and the rate of change is also fairly exceptional as well. So we're talking about squeezing almost the entirety of this transition now into 25 years. So 25 years of um, at least a million heat pumps being installed a year. The graph on the um, right hand side um, shows another very important element of this transition, and that's to do with uh, costs. So the bar chart on the um, upper side of the graph shows the annual investment costs that need to happen. Um, in terms of financial terms, we're talking around £10 billion a year, all the way to 2050. Um, that's uh, slightly front loaded towards energy efficiency towards the beginning because that's very cost effective. Um, but around uh, eight to 10 billion pounds is the sort of uh, number that we're looking at. Um, and this is just for homes. Um, and uh, the other big chunk of that is, is low carbon heating, which becomes more important as time goes on. Um, but the thing that really interests me about this graph is that those costs are really an investment in the future, um, an investment in decarbonisation, but now also, of course, an investment in getting off gas. Um, the dotted line below that um, shows the annual cost in terms of operating the system. And what this is showing actually is that overall, the total costs of heating our homes, if we do this net zero, you know, if we meet the targets, those costs actually go down in total. Um, and that's because the energy efficiency uh, measures drive costs down, but also because actually once you um, install heat pumps and you're making the most of low carbon electricity, they can also be cheaper to run. The important thing to bear in mind is that this analysis was done before the gas price escalations which started in October last year um, and which have continued to increase. So that dotted line um, will be even lower indicating even bigger savings. Analysis by the Regulatory Assistance Project um, which is featured in the media has shown that now um, even under the current pricing structure heat pumps running at a, a fairly average COP uh, sorry, it's coefficient of performance, so an overall efficiency of about 300%, which should be achievable for most newly installed heat pumps, <clears throat> will be cheaper to run than a gas boiler. 
This is something that has changed, changed over the past year, primarily because the cost of um, gas has risen more than the cost of electricity. Um, in effect, the renewables on the electricity system and other existing generation have brought down the relative cost of electricity compared to gas. This already makes running costs for heat pumps look better. Energy efficiency measures can further drive down bills. And really this is um, showing what that previous Committee on Climate Change um, graph showed, um, but this is showing it in terms of annual running costs for a particular household. And this is now um, for a typical house heated by a gas boiler. But there are also a number of other benefits that we can bring into the mix. Uh, we can um, further reduce bills through time of use pricing and various suppliers offer heat pump tariffs even, or variable tariffs um, in general. <clears throat> Solar photovoltaics can also be added into people's energy systems. Um, and uh, roughly, if you have a solar um, system and a, a heat pump, um, you can produce around a third of your own um, total heat pump energy demand. That can further bring down your operating costs. Um, and actually, even if you don't have a heat pump, our analysis suggests that um, a house with a gas boiler and with solar panels would be saving money, even without any subsidy for those solar panels. And that's because the relative cost of electricity has gone up so much um, and the cost of solar has come down. Um, and perhaps there are other elements that we can add to this value stack. And historically, we've talked about value stacks when we think about energy utilities and energy distribution companies. But increasingly, we need to think about how we can bring these multiple elements of value towards the household level. Um, and I'm very pleased that our analysis was featured in the eye a couple of weeks ago, which suggests that you can make significant bill reductions if you have a combination of a heat pump um, and a um, solar panels in a house. And a saving of £460 a year compared to a house with a gas boiler starts making the payback periods for heat pumps for the first time look viable um, when they haven't been before. Um, and so the, the relative level of subsidy can come down. <clears throat> but um, this all needs to be wrapped up in some sort of package. Um, the energy security context, um, it, it, it's obvious that the, um, the idea of getting off gas has gained traction, getting off fossil fuel imports in general has gained traction. Um, and looking at my own house, I have a heat pump in here, I have solar panels on the roof. The heat pump alone has reduced the total gas use in this that we use for energy in this house by 82%. And that's even with gas making around half of the electricity mix. So the actual energy efficiency implications of doing this are quite staggering. The solar uh, panels add even more of a reduction onto that. But all of this has significant capital implications um, for households. Very few people have a few thousand pounds spare, at least that might be needed for, for solar panels and a heat pump. Um, and um, this will be beyond most households means. Um, and so clearly there are implications for the requirements for capital support from government to do all of this. Um, and we're not just talking about grants and there's also potential for loans too. And if we look to the North towards Scotland, we're already seeing packages of measures being offered to households um, and they're very, very popular. But the other element of this is that <clears throat> all of this needs to be brought together. These packages need to be wrapped up for people because technologically these things are quite complicated. Um, I've managed to do it, other people have managed to do it, but actually having the, the, the heat pump, talking to the solar, talking to a time of use tariff is not always very straightforward. Um, so policy needs to deliver capital support um, and the market needs to be incentivized to deliver combinations of packages that deliver excellent consumer outcomes um, because without consumers on board this challenge is going to be nearly impossible I think. Um, so that's what I wanted to say for a, a hopefully a quite quick introduction. Um, I really hope that our panel will be able to um, talk to some of these ideas in more detail. We've got a great panel. Um, I'll hand over first to uh, Dara Vias from Energy UK. Um, Dara, just to um, introduce you quickly. Um, and please uh, forgive me if I get anything wrong or you want to add anything. Um, Dara has been working on sustainable on energy for, for low, well over a decade now. Um, I think you spent a decade alone uh, with Consumer Futures, which became Citizens Advice. Um, and I've seen you multiple times at various events, um, including at the Citizens Assembly on Climate Change. Uh, Dara is now Deputy Director at Energy UK, which is the UK's uh, largest energy trade association. So uh, Dara, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, and um, I think that your opening remarks are 
but perfect in terms of leading into to the, some of the things I'd, I'd like to cover. Um, I think it's incredibly timely. When Richard first spoke to me about this webinar, I mean, I could never have predicted, I don't think any of us could have predicted where we'd be in the energy market right now. Um, when we started talking about this a few weeks ago, the scale and pace of external change globally on energy markets and indeed I think the spotlight that's now on household energy efficiency and decarbonizing heat. Um, some of the spotlight's really welcome, particularly in this space. I think it's for far too long. So many of us have been saying that there's not enough support or attention for the issue of decarbonizing heat in buildings, um, despite the vital role that it plays in the balance pathway for the CCC's six carbon budget. And, and Rich said, showed some really good slides on those. I think the CCC itself, I don't know if anybody is on, is on the webinar from the CCC, but um, interesting kind of conversations with them over the last few weeks about what current energy prices mean for them, the balance pathway. But turning uh, specifically to heat pumps, I think it's going to be crucial to consider how we make sure the market model to get more heat pumps on walls works for people, works for more people and more households. Optimising the benefits from heat pumps potentially means shifting to a different market model really from a sort of drop and go or box on the wall approach to a more long-term leasing bundled contract models engaging with other bits of demand side reduction and flexibility that people might want to put in their homes or indeed energy efficiency improvements i think mass market adoption of heat pumps really does rest on quality and not just quality of the product but i think it's about the quality of the entire experience we don't talk enough about it but i think as we expect and want more on walls, we should be thinking about quality of experience. I think from making a decision about the most suitable product and service for your home and for your, your household um, to, to understanding the contract, um, how the installation process goes. And then of course, how supported you feel as you get used to it and work out how to make it right for your, for your home. Um, and you know, it's really important that we have a decent process for what happens if and when things go wrong, because things do go wrong. And often it's about how things are sorted when they go wrong, that um, forms and shapes how people feel about it, what they say about it, word of mouth in anything to do with home related changes, um, experience with traders, experience with them. Um, buying or purchasing things that word of mouth is, is crucial. We've seen it, the learning from things like the smart meter rollout, how important it is um, that people have a good experience with, with making any sort of energy related changes to homes. And one of the ways we talk about this is to talk about this being a customer journey. And I think this customer journey with heat pumps could be an issue without some proper long-term engagement between consumers, between people and, and the providers, the heat pump providers and service providers. Energy retail companies, I think, are really well placed to stack some of those build savings that we talked about and that demand side revenue streams to reduce those costs to customers. Government's marketplace approach is good. I think there's some, some, some good stuff happening, but we'd like to see more competition in, in a couple of areas. So I'm just going to expand on those. The first, I think, is competition between approaches. Um, the... The heat and building strategy, you know, has this market-based mechanism. And I think that Energy UK does support that market-based approach and agrees on the need for closer working between government departments, closer working with industry and more support on what you'd call enabling policies, those policies around skills, finance, planning, energy prices. But I think there's scope to go further on competition and to facilitate competition between different approaches. So, you know, thinking about a social housing first approach or an area based approach or utilising local regional governance and, you know, potential for green finance options, a new UK investment bank. But changes such as an earlier phase out date for fossil fuel heating and social homes and restoring sort of social housing providers ability to charge a higher rate to recoup investment. I think these are all things that you know, could unlock thousands of new installations and help scale up delivery. So I think we should be quite open-minded about how we encourage competition between different approaches. Um, another thing, another area I think that we'd quite like to see a bit more competition is between different eligible technologies when it comes to decarbonizing heat in homes. I think from a policy focus, you could argue is a little bit binary. It's a necessary focus on driving down costs, scaling up inevitable focuses, you know, sort of focuses support on the lowest cost model, which is air source, arguably. I think it risks undervaluing potential other benefits from ground source, like higher efficiency, higher system benefits, 
or other shared loop systems. There's quite, there's, I think there's some concerns, growing concerns around how much attention there is on reducing emissions from replacement heating on the gas grid where people aren't offered connection to a heat network or hydrogen and aren't comfortable switching to a fuel, to like a full heat pump. So there's space, I think, to be more creative on policy levers like carbon-based product standards um, compact hybrid heat pumps, very like smart direct electric heating, smart electric storage heating, and other variants. I think, especially for low demand properties, because there, there are low demand properties where a full heat pump might not be warranted, or multi tenanted properties where communal systems might be more efficient. So, there's, I think, there is some space for creativity in the low carbon heat space as well. Um, I appreciate we're, we're going to focus on heat pumps today. I think the last thing I'd say is, I think there's some. It's really important that whichever direction we go in with this, we don't just replicate the existing boiler market, but with air source heat pumps instead. Um, it will work, but it's not optimal. We've got an opportunity here to really improve the customer journey, to achieve real system-wide benefits. We're going through this huge cost of living crisis with energy prices, you know, headline news day after day. When we talk about retail market reform, it shouldn't just be in a silo. This is a whole system-wide reform that's needed, I think. It's about how we can, you know, flex demand on the system and heat pumps are a great opportunity to do that. And it has to be part and parcel of how we reform the retail market and how we think about how people engage with energy use in their home. For so long, it's about switching provider has been a measure of how you engage with energy in your home and it's got to go further than that um, and deeper too so i'll stop there and, and leave us some time for conversation thanks rick uh, thanks very much dara um that's wonderful and i've got some questions for you later i think that's you touched on some really really interesting things around um other technologies and also introducing competition here and and the idea of transforming not just the, the technologies but also the way we think about the market as well so um, that's great, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Tina Fawcett now. Um, Tina uh, is a um, really a, a piece of furniture in the, the UK's energy research landscape. Um, she's been publishing um, research around primarily energy efficiency for over 25 years. Um, if you work in energy, um, you will have um, heard of Tina before. Um, she's been involved with UKIRK before, though I don't think you're involved uh, with this phase right now. Um, and she's based in the Environmental Change um, Units, uh, sorry, the Environmental Change Institute at the uh, University of Oxford. Um, so a very, very well-known um, academic energy research unit. So um, thanks very much for your time joining us, Tina. Um, and I think today, Tina, you'll be talking about the shape of the research landscape around energy efficiency and heat pumps. Um, yeah, that's right. Thanks, Richard. I don't, don't like to think what kind of, what sort of furniture I might be <laughs> from that. Right, so I'm just gonna try and share my screen. Um, um, well, um, first of all, uh, Great to be here. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, and, and what I'm going to talk about briefly is just um, some of the UK research that's happening in the UK about heat pumps, which I know is a bit um, perhaps removed from the, um, you know, everyday implementation and policy issues, but obviously it does inform all of that. So I thought it's, um, you know, helpful just to show some of the things that we're thinking about and looking at at the moment. Most of this research isn't my research, it's other people's research. So it's sort of not, it's not, um, I don't know all the details of it, but we'll give an overview. And um, I'm also speaking as a member of one of the other research consortiums, which is CRED, the Centre for Research into Energy Demand Solutions. Um, but as Richard said, it also used to work um, with UKIRK. Right. Okay. Um, so one of the um, one of the uh, ways in which the research funders um, want to help people access research that's happening, particularly um, um, manufacturers, installers, and um, other academics, other researchers, is they've created a network um, for the decarbonisation of heating and cooling, which I'm involved with, along with six other universities, and this is run from the University of Durham, and um, I've put the website on the address, and this. Basically, it links together a lot of existing research investments, which I'll show briefly on the next slide. Um, and we also um, have a small amount of research funding that we give out and we have quite a lot of events. So 
I mean, I'm not sure if it's very good form to um, promote one one webinar at another webinar, but we have we have got one coming up later this month on ground source heat and smart local energy systems, for example. I'll probably put the details in the chat. So it's a sort of active research network in a way that people can find out what's going on. Um, and as well as the sort of communication um, inside this network, um, there are 23 different projects that are primarily um, engineering and science driven projects all about um, decarbonizing heating and cooling and quite a number of those are to do with heat pumps, although of course there's lots of other projects too. And I've just taken a snapshot off the website here, so I think the ones there are not particularly heat pumpy, but um, there are there are others. And each of these projects has got a, like a little 10 minute video introduction where one of the researchers on the projects explains what they're doing and, and what they're trying to achieve. Um, and just to take a couple of examples, so one of those, I was looking at a couple of the heat, the um, heat pump projects. So there's one run by Xi, Xi Bin Yu at Glasgow and that he's looking at flexible air source heat pumps and sort of looking at improving how the technology operates and making it better suited, making it more efficient. So, you know, essentially in the end, so customers get better value out of them. And then there's a sort of more radical technology project being run by um, Javier Moye at um, Cambridge University, and they're looking at new, they're sort of looking at solid heat transfer, so caloric heat transfer is called, so a, a, to, a sort of different technology for creating heat pumps around. And again, you know, obviously it's with the idea that you'd get something more efficient, lower cost, and enabling this sort of mass take up of heat, heat pump projects. So there's these 23 projects that are mostly engineering and science focused, but also often include some work on policy and economics. So that's something the, um, the UK research councils are putting quite a lot of money into. Um, my own, this sort of research consortium I'm in is also doing a bit of work on heat pumps, and this is tending to be more integrating with the people side. So we're not doing purely engineering research. Um, and for example, the bottom, I've, I've just highlighted two research studies here, but the bottom one called consumers or users. And it's really about how the experience of people in a trial on how they learned to use these um, smart hybrid heat pumps and on how they integrated them into their everyday lives. And the research is really making the case that we need to understand how people understand, use these things, learn about them, um, bring them into life because that's a really important part as well about delivering good quality for people if we only think about the technology and not the people and how they use it and what it means to them then we won't get the right mix and people won't get what they want out of this so obviously you know we, we think that's important to do that sort of research as well um, and the final sort of research I wanted to mention is the much bigger sort of um, closer to delivery research. So at the moment, there's three major um, trials that are funded by Innovate UK. They're called Smart Local Energy System Trials, and they include heating sort of electrification trials, basically. So they're electrification of, of heating and transport, and they, they have batteries in them, and they have smartness in them, and they're sort of locally based. Um, and there are two in Oxfordshire, so I'm involved in one called Energy Superhub Oxford, and there's another local Energy Oxfordshire, and then there's one up in Orkney as well. Um, and then you can see the picture there is a picture of um, a ground source heat pump well being drilled in a social housing estate in Oxford um, to use ground source heat pumps on a shared loop and then try and do some smart stuff as well around time of use um, with social housing tenants. So it's really... Um, trying to you know some of those technology components are known but it's bringing in the smartness as a way of basically trying to reduce costs for people I mean that's you know it's not smart for its own sake again it's sort of focusing on you know how are we going to make the best of these technologies that we've got um, by trialing them um, in different ways and and the other projects are trialing different elements of um, you know heat pumps or looking at business models and doing you know all sorts of things not only on heat pumps so um, yeah, I think I'll close now. It's just just to say there's quite a lot of research, active research, interesting research going on. And if people have got ideas about gaps or research gaps and things, then it'd be really interesting to hear what you think. Or if you find, you know, particular bits of research useful, again, that's that's good for us to know about what's really valuable to people. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. 
and that's great. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions at the end. Um, and I believe we have quite a few policy interested people here too. So um, in particular, it would be great to think about how the uh, research can link up with the policy direction um, too. So, um, okay, I'll stop talking and hand over now to um, Leah Robson. Um, Leah Robson, I, I've got to know fairly well over the past couple of years. Um, Leah is an inadvertent domestic energy policy ed, um, expert, really, um, having worked on uh, the sharp end of, of domestic energy installs uh, for about a decade, I think, Leah, in total, um, including um, working through um, the feed-in tariff, um, as well as um, seeing the RHI come into existence, um, seeing its closure, um, and seeing the transformation um, or potential transformation towards the um, boiler upgrade scheme, which will come in, um, in theory, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, um, Leah, um, over to you, and I should say, Leah, is now director of an installation business that focuses on heat pumps, but also does solar too. Um, and she has um, a team of uh, very um, highly skilled um, and sort of UK leading engineers um, within the, the body. So um, over to you, Leah, thank you. Thanks, Rich. I'm starting to wonder if I would actually make more money being a social policy kind of consultant than I actually am installing heat pumps <laughs> at the moment. So uh, yeah, anyway, moving on. I um, Yeah, there's a few things I wanted to talk about. And I think, if we imagine heat pumps kind of having all these other aspects to them, kind of some supporting the heat pump rollout and some really weighing it down, um, I think it's quite a useful way to, to kind of talk about it. So to start off with the things that um, I think are really supporting the heat pump rollout because they're really good things for society as a whole and they could be something that we use heat pumps to kind of leverage and make happen. Um, so we could be transforming the workforce. Um, I think it was Dara, you said, we really don't want to replicate the boiler um, install model. Um, a particular passion of mine is bringing more women into this workforce. Because um, uh, as Rich says, I've been in it for 10 years now and I could count on the fingers of one hand the amount of times I've worked with fellow women installers or women on building sites who weren't um, generally the cleaners or the office um, admin staff. So um, that would be an absolutely fantastic thing to do. And we really have an opportunity to use heat pumps as a way to do that, mainly because we've got so many young people out there who are so passionate about the environment. And um, I think we have a real opportunity if we seize hold of it to promote jobs in heat pump installation, particularly to young women um, as an opportunity to do something really literally constructive about the climate crisis. And um, they're incredibly rewarding jobs. Um, they're incredibly demanding jobs, um, but a, a huge amount of satisfaction comes, comes out of them. So I think that's one thing that, um, that we could really be, be doing to improve uh, society at, at large at the same time as bringing in heat pumps. The other thing that would kind of support the heat pump rollout is to actually decouple it from two other things uh, that are also going on. One is improved energy efficiency and the other is uh, low temperature heating systems. So um, just to get a little bit technical, um, when you install a heat pump, generally you want it to be um, to have the water that's coming out of the heat pump that's going around your radiators or around your underfloor heating. You want that to be as cool as possible, but still able to heat the house. So generally we would be aiming to send roughly kind of 45 or 50 degree water around your home. Um, if you have a gas boiler, um, whenever your gas boiler comes on, it will almost certainly come on and put water around 70 or 80 degrees around your radiators. Now, that doesn't have to be the way that gas boilers work. Unfortunately, it is by and large the way that gas boilers work in this country. So um, one of the things that kind of makes the heat pump rollout much more expensive and much more complex is that as well as trying to roll out heat pumps, we're also trying to convert homes to low temperature heating. So in order to do that conversion, you generally need larger radiators. And uh, we're not talking about radiators that kind of take up the entire wall. Often it's just changing the thickness of a, of a radiator. Um, and often there's pipe work changes to make as well. So uh, it's really important to remember that when we talk about the heat pump rollout, we're not just talking about the actual box that produces the heat. We are also talking about the rest of the system that it goes on to. And um, I think we confuse two issues too often by conflating those two transitions together. And we'd, ha we'd have a bit more clarity about how to roll out heat pumps well 
And maybe there are opportunities to kind of run heat pump ready programs into people's homes that are separate from then actually installing a heat pump. It just causes a lot of confusion and I don't think it's a very helpful um, way to think about it all wrapped into one. And the other is around energy efficiency. There's an awful lot of debate about how well insulated a home needs to be in order for a heat pump to work. Um, the short news is that a heat pump will heat any home you like as long as you size it properly. Um, that might mean you might need two heat pumps if you have a drafty large old barn, um, but you can heat any building at all with a heat pump. Um, and so we then need to look at what is the optimum kind of fabric upgrade that we need in order to run a heat pump successfully. And at the moment, that's very skewed by the fact that gas is still so much more expensive than electricity, sorry, so much cheaper than electricity. And as Rich says, we're starting to see that come together. But at the moment, um, even though heat pumps are so much more efficient than gas boilers, um, we still see those real kind of uh, expenses to run a heat pump if you don't sort out the fabric. So you could either see that as a, as a positive thing that it will in, encourage us to do more about energy efficiency um, in order to roll out heat pumps. But I think there's a question of degree. How far do you need to go in the insulation and um, draft proofing of a home before you decide that it's, that it's heat pump ready? And there's a, a big debate to be had there. And I think we really need to um, bottom that one out um, so that we're very clear about exactly what you need to do before you put in a heat pump because uh, you see a lot of people saying oh yes well we have to have solid wall insulation we have to have all these other things um, done before we can actually even make a heat pump work um, the other thing that would be really really useful to help uh, support a heat pump rollout would be a stable subsidy regime so um, as an installer i uh, am now looking down the barrel of probably six or seven weeks when I almost certainly won't be able to install any heat pumps. That's because the RHI scheme comes to an end uh, at the, on the 31st of March. So we're absolutely flat out at the moment trying to get heat pumps installed. And then uh, although the new bus scheme uh, is meant to start on the 1st of April, there are gonna be no vouchers available until, well, you can't apply for a voucher until the 23rd of May. So, uh, we are not made of money and we cannot afford to install heat pumps at the risk that those 5Ks may or may not appear um, in a decent length of time. And we certainly can't continue to install heat pumps at our normal rate in the hope that we'll get a voucher on the 23rd of May and that will all go brilliantly. So that doesn't help installers and it doesn't help consumers because um, customers are just, it's a very complex journey as we've talked about before anyway, to have a heat pump installed um, and also you're just overcomplicating it if we have difficult to negotiate subsidy regimes. And also uh, it stops that lovely thing of customers being able to recommend their friends to have an install because very often the conversation goes, oh, well, I've installed a heat pump, but I had it done under the RHI. So that's not available anymore. So I don't, I don't kind of, so it breaks that chain of, of customer recommendation as well, which is a real, which is a real shame too. Um, so uh, one other thing that um, we could kind of really, need to look at is, is the amount of information that people need before they buy a heat pump um, and also the amount of information that an installer needs in order to be able to properly install a heat pump so i am generally on the sales side and the technical design uh, i have to ask customers some quite intimate questions before we install a heat pump um, how much hot water do you generally use are you generally um, kind of family that all take uh, showers in the morning um, so just to make sure that we get the heat pump all set up right uh, do you keep your heating on overnight because um, as part of this transition we're kind of taking people on a journey where they go from quite often having their heating blasting out uh, as, I, as I was saying at kind of 80 degrees when they get home from work um, and then probably clicking off overnight and then blasting out again at, at half past six in the morning before they before they get up with a heat pump, you really don't want to run it that way. Um, you want to just keep it ticking along. Um, one of my engineers talks about just kind of keeping it at simmering, simmering point. So not boiling over, not, not going off, just that's the most efficient way to run a heat pump. So we have to talk to customers about, are they happy to have 
the heating on overnight. Um, we maybe have to think about where we position radiators in relation to people's beds so that they don't kind of, it's, it's, it's the kind of minutiae of, of people's lives that, that we have to deal with. And um, also people have loads and loads and loads of questions. So as an installer, I can spend hours and hours uh, replying to incredibly lengthy emails um, because customers need to know an awful lot before they install a heat pump. So maybe one of the things that could be out there to support um, customers would be more detailed in-depth information from, um, from a, a kind of a non-biased source that they could, they could access to know about how to install heat pumps. Um, so, uh, and one final thing would be um, just about uh, connection to the, to the national grid. Um, Currently, if your boiler breaks tomorrow, you could probably, uh, if you can find a plumber, have it uh, swapped over by the end of next week, maybe. Um, if, you, if your boiler breaks and you want to put in a heat pump, uh, one of the challenges, apart from finding an installer, which is probably also quite tricky, is also to um, apply to connect the heat pump to the DNO. So a lot of heat pumps require permission to connect to the, to the national grid. Um, not all of them, but, but quite a number do. So we just kind of seem to have an awful lot of barriers in the way of people, people putting in, in heat pumps, which, which makes the process much more complex and much more expensive and, and time consuming. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things that we could, as I said, kind of be hanging off the rollout to, to really improve uh, society as a, as a whole, as well as just rolling out heat pumps around diversity of the workforce um, and also around just having more comfortable to live in, more energy efficient, uh, low temperature heating. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Leah. And it, it's so valuable to have your practical insights from um, installing these every day. Um, we would have have really uh, missed not having you here and also thanks for being such a late addition to the panel um much appreciated too um, and your um, idea of moving radiators away from um uh, beds and so on is, is really interesting and um just the idea of personal comfort is so variable too and it's one of the it's a good example of the complexities of, of all of this in particular um i can see a, a large number of questions in the chat um apologies in advance i'm not sure we'll be able to answer them all but i'll start from the beginning um I think Julie Andrews said that was a very good place to start, so we can go with that. Um, so first of all, there's a question at the top from Anonymous. Um, thank you very much. And I should say, if you've put a question in the chat rather than the Q&A, please put it into the Q&A because I can't see it otherwise. Uh, a question here about the inclusion of air-to-air -air heat pumps in subsidies um, because they can offer cooling. Um, and I believe there's also another question further down um, around the cost of air-to-air -air heat pump installs. So, um, Leah, I think that's probably a question best directed to you, but anyone else that wants to come in, Tina, you might have some perspectives on the, no, um, uh, Leah, over to you then, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends a little bit whether you're talking about retrofit or new build, um, putting in an air-to-air -air heat pump is is quite a challenge in a, in a retrofit situation. Um, yes, they, yeah, they obviously they do, they do offer cooling. There are some ways of uh, not I think we would call it comfort cooling rather than what we would know as air conditioning. There are some ways of doing an amount of cooling um, with air source heat pumps, but it's not as extensive as you would get from from air to air. So yes, yeah, they're a good they're a good product in the right in the right place. Um, probably more suited to new builds than than retrofits in general. Though. Thanks, Leah. Dara, do you have anything to add on um, air to air? Um, just to say, I had a, a conversation at Christmas actually with um, my um, some, some in laws. Um, who were talking about getting aircon installed in their house after last year because it was just so cheap. Facebook adverts coming up for installed for I think less than two thousand um, pounds, and that will provide cooling as well as heating. Um, currently, there are no plans I don't think in terms of UK policy to include them um, within any sort of subsidy at the moment. Um, okay, the next question is um, around uh, time of use tariffs and how they can be sped up. Um, Dara, perhaps this is a question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I touched a little bit on um, the uh, the importance of thinking about this in the wider context of reforming the retail energy market. Um, I think this the 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 time of use tariff of space before the um, current gas price crisis and and the 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 there's. There really aren't many tariffs out there right now. There's not much choice when it comes to tariffs. And 
as I was saying, you know, we've developed a, a market in response to government framework, CMA directives, and the need to, you know, competition has been measured by, by customer switching in this market. But with such so few tariffs available right now, if we cast our minds back, we were sort of on the cusp of some interesting different models and tariffs. If Clem was here, she'd be talking about Octopus Agile and Octopus Go, very much in relation to um, the EV, the EV market more than anything else. I think speeding up the provision of time of use tariffs, I think we do need to get through the cost of living crisis first and foremost. I think there's a lot of discussion about the um, retail market reform, off gems and answer review, basis and answer review. I think to managing the risks with demand side are really, really important because that's how we'll give people confidence. What we do know is that there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a few gaps, I guess, in the protections, consumer protections, regulations, um, to help and support people through you know what's covered what's not what what happens when something goes wrong we did some work um energy uk citizens advice and the ade which is the um association for decentralized energy i think i've got that right and um, did some work looking at the customer journey for people who want to get involved in um demand side and, and flexibility in their homes and, and what we did um if I remember correctly, is we kind of tried to look at what the potential risks are, where those risks are covered by existing legislation. This is risk very much from a customer point of view, you know, where would you be taking a bit of a chance because actually if something goes wrong, what happens? So where they'd be covered by existing legislation. I think we looked at, you know, what work that was currently being done to address some of the risks and where there might be protection gaps in the future. And I think those protection gaps are the where the focus ought to be. I think we need to close some of those gaps because that'll give people confidence to um, engage and have a go. Um, it's all wrapped up in, you know, making sure that we have an energy system, a power system that's with a, a modern, a modern, power, modern power system that can respond to demand. But there's a whole host of work on that consumer side that I think is so important because right now it's it's just incredibly confusing and hard for people to engage. Um, and that's if there were more flexible tariffs available. I think we've got a lot to do to get through with the gas price crisis, with the current um, current situation with energy prices and predictions. Um, and hopefully we will reform the retail market so that we can build and develop the sorts of relationships with customers that I think we need to have, the sorts of relationships where you are thinking about bundling a product and a service and considering having a heat pump and thinking about what your best tariff is and then understanding how to get things changed um, if and when you need to. So it's a bit of a rambling response because I feel like the answer to this would have been very different six months ago compared to the market we're in today. Um, it's not the top of the agenda, but it really ought to be because it's a big part of the solution. Thanks, Dara. Tina, do you want to come in? Yeah, just briefly, just to say that the um, the ground source heat pump, shared loop heat pump um, project that's happening in Oxford, the idea was we were going to persuade the social housing tenant, well, going to ask them if they would go on to a sort of flexible time of use tariff. And because, because of the changes in price, we actually don't think it's ethical to ask people to do that now because they'd be taking far too much risk and... You, you know, so it just sort of, I think it just brings out, you know, Dara's point of actually, you know, I mean, there always were sort of, of course, it's a, you know, it's flexible tariff, there was always going to be a bit of a risk, but it's become, you know, at the moment, in particular, it's just not a suitable option for a lot of people. You know, it's funny as well, I think that it's easy for people to forget that Economy 7 and Economy 10 have been around for a long time, and all of the research, and I'm sure people on the panel know more than I do about this, but my understanding is all the research has always shown that it is incredibly confusing for people to know when and how to, uh, you know, use energy at its cheapest and to the most advantageous um, to, to that household. And actually, this is an opportunity for technology, isn't it, to, to break down that confusion and to address some of those, those issues. 
Thanks, Dara. Um, you, you've led us on to uh, the next question in the chat quite helpfully, which is around um, linking heat pumps to heat networks. Um, so, so, Tina, do you want to say a bit more about that? And, and in particular, the questions about how you can soak up more renewable electricity, perhaps at times of um, low demand or um, high renewables output? Well, I mean, the, the uh, project I was mentioning is, is very, is very, very small. They're sort of, you know, they're sort of heat, um, ground source heat pumps that are sharing the heat between two or three homes. So it's a very small network. Um, I know that the company who are involved there, Kenza, have got this vision of where you could have sort of community scale, um, you know, heat networks based on ground source heat pumps, which is quite quite you know it's a bit different from a traditional heat network because as Leah was saying it's low temperature heat so you don't have to have this massive sort of insulated pipe network because actually the heat that's flowing through is not particularly high temperature and it's quite an interesting vision of the future of how you could use heat pumps on a larger network or community scale but but it that's very much a vision I don't know possibly perhaps in other countries they are further on with this I don't know if other people know about that but I think it's starting that thinking because you know as we know in the UK um, heat networks in general haven't been something that have taken off in most places here. There's kind of been a small niche and you see, you know, research reports or the CCC, people come out and keep saying, yeah, we should have a lot more of these. And yet it doesn't happen for a variety of quite complicated reasons. Um, so I don't know what others views are about whether this beyond the house scale is going to be another way of making it more affordable and attractive or if that's just a complication too far. I think it's a really important point, and and Tina, you've pointed really neatly towards another question in the chat, which was around, um, I think the engagement of local authorities. Sorry, I've lost the, the uh, thread a bit now, but um, it's always seemed to me that for, in particular, for heat networks and for energy efficiency delivery, um, particularly if we're going to get by to things like street by street deployment, that uh, you know, when I was a, a young student, we were talking about as a as a practical thing to do that was happening elsewhere in the world, um, and those sorts of local approaches really seem to have um, come to a stop yet. For delivering heat networks, which are seen to be so important, um, that that governance structure just isn't there yet. Um, so um, I don't know, uh, Dara, if you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think local government is and local authorities are really essential to the entirety of the energy transition. If I'm, if I'm honest, I think you know local area energy plans. What we do know is that they're fairly patchy. They're done at different levels across the country. I think it's slightly different in Scotland because there's a bit more of a national framework from the Scottish government on what ought to or could be in one. Um, we don't have a system of governance that's kind of routine across the country. We don't have sort of set regional areas um, and regional authority for every area. So the, there's that patchiness, there's town councils, parish councils, but all of that aside, actually local area energy planning is, is, is important for the actual planning and building side of things, which is a huge issue for um, Oh, Richard, I can see your dog. So cute. <laughs> I got distracted. Sorry. Um, nice. <laughs> so um, I think I think it's really important because because actually, you know, it's it's local authorities that can deliver. The concern is whether they have the funding and the expertise. You know, I think it has to be properly funded. And you have to build up that expertise. What they are experts in is their, is their place, and so that area-based approach. You know, utilizing local regional government, thinking about you know, restoring social housing providers' ability to charge a higher rate. You know, the warm rent stuff. Um, thinking about how you coordinate with private leaseholders in an area as well. I think there's a lot to be gained from it. I mentioned the smart meter rollout earlier as well. Um, you know, I think. I think a lot of people reflect on whether or not it would have been better if it was a, a network led street by street, you know, these, sometimes there's a lot of efficiency gains. So definitely think that's a good question. Another one, local, the local area aspect of the Green Home Grant, the most successful part of what essentially was not a successful scheme. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there, but it has to be well resourced because we know local authorities are in cash what last, Last Christmas, I think Croydon went bankrupt. You know, it is, it's a live issue that they're, they're not particularly um, well funded and they're facing multiple concerns across society and they're trying to tackle a lot. So yes, local authorities, but let's not just dump it on them. Let's support them to deliver. Thanks, Dara. Sorry for the um, interruption of the dog there. 
Um, there are loads of questions left and some really, really good ones. I think we should go through afterwards and, and try and tackle. I don't know how we'll do that. Um, I'm going to try and group um, the uh, two final questions together, really, and ask the whole panel them. So um, the first one is, is, is about joining this up. Um, and there are a few questions in the chat. There's one about making sure energy efficiency happens at the same time. Um, we mentioned already uh, bringing flow temperatures down at the same time. I've talked about solar too. Um, and also um, ensuring there's a question about ensuring performance of heat pumps too, because if the heat pumps installed poorly, um, it will it will certainly cost more than the gas boiler. That's that's a huge issue, and they have to be installed properly to to achieve the, the cost reductions that are possible and and the best outcome. So, um, from a panel perspective, how do you join these things up? And you know, what is the one thing that has to happen? And I'll go over to you, um, Leah. First, sorry to pick you. That's a million dollar question. That is. Um, if if I could kind of have a have a dream wish it would be that uh, you had people within local authorities who were um, well trained and able to provide objective um, advice maybe it's um, retrofit advisors who are you know already kind of doing doing this role to a certain extent um, and they would be the first point of contact for people when they wanted to improve the energy efficiency of, of their home um, and then some kind of a, a scheme of, of recommended installers that would then follow in be behind but the, the biggest problem we see is that there's too often this uh, a kind of a disjunct between the advisor and the installer those two things have to be absolutely tightly tightly bound together or else um, you'll get a whole load of advice that is just out of date or not not practical in in reality but somehow you've got to crack that need for independent well-informed advice um i mean we offer it as a paid service but clearly that's not it, it takes a lot of time and it's expensive um it's clearly not not scalable for the majority of, of people that's going to have to be a, a free service and then installers like us would come in behind to, to install a specific technology Thanks, Leah. Uh, Tina, over to you. How do we wrap this all up? Well, I mean, I think that, yeah, that, that was really interesting. I mean, another another overarching thing, I suppose, is the skills, isn't it? It's sort of getting people, you know, recognising high quality green jobs and giving people the skills to do them and the sort of flexible skills. So, I mean, briefly, we, we worked with the Federation of Master Builders um, recently on a report that was about retrofit, but it was quite interesting hearing from some of the master builders saying their young apprentices and trainees are actually really keen to specialise in the green skills side and see that as a separate profession and as a way of them kind of making their living and contributing to society. So I think, you know, of course, it's not all just about skills. There's got to be customer pull and, you know, there's all sorts of things. But I think recognising the value of this work and equipping people to do it, that's that's part of it. Thanks, Tina. Um, I agree. And I, I think the skills challenge is, is so underappreciated still that the number of people needed alone is, is extraordinary. Um, and Dara, um, over to you, you mentioned retail market reforms as well. Um, great to your perspective. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, we're... I think it's pretty universally agreed that the retail market has to change the operating model of that market. But as I said, I think it has to be done in conjunction with, you know, everything that's happening to modernise the power market. And that does have a lot to do with current affairs. It, it is about the things we're talking about, about getting more renewables, diversifying our um, energy and making sure we're investing in homegrown domestic energy. Um, and linking it up with smart systems and flexibility work and thinking about it in its entirety because that retail part of it is the part that's going to deliver the behavior change if we go back to um some of the things actually we talked about at the um, climate assembly which the stuff around actually a lot of the journey to net zero has been delivered by that power generation side of the market so far and the next step is that harder step it's making those changes to behaviors one of those behaviors is you know, how our homes use energy, how we improve the efficiency of our homes. Um, and I think that the retail market has an awful lot that it could deliver here if we could unlock its potential. So there's that retail market bit and there's that wider behaviour change um, piece as well. And just to reiterate some of what Leah said as well, I think that the independent advice and support and information protection 
it, it's incredibly patchy at the moment. Um, and the work that we did at Systems Advice on sort of just looking through the contacts and doing some analysis of the people who do reach out and ask for help when it comes to making energy related changes to homes. And that's tip of the iceberg compared to probably the breadth of issues faced by people across the country. It's far too complicated, may need to make it easier. Thanks very much, Dara. Um, so uh, apologies if I've not covered um, some of the questions. I've, I've tried my best, but there are just too many. Um, a final question for everyone, and if you could keep your answers relatively brief, that would be great. Uh, and I'm going to try and pull two questions together. So um, the, the comment from the chat is um, there's really been a, a failure around condensing boilers because many of them aren't condensing. Um, and this was a, a product replacement system without much thought about whether we had bigger radiators or um, water set to the right levels. Um, so in light of that particular um, policy failure, you know, the, the condensing boilers worked and that policy implemented was, was fine, but the performance wasn't fine. Um, what is your one heat pump policy priority? Um, Leah, over to you first. Independent monitoring. So you can actually see how well heat pumps are performing. That's it. Okay. Um, thanks, Leah. Um, and quickly, how much do you think that would cost? Would that be money well spent? You think so, so currently, if I want to put monitoring in as an extra on a job, the cost to me of the components are around about £450. Um, I'm sure bigger installers can buy them cheaper because they can buy at scale, but that's still quite a lot to add to a job when I have to then make some margin on that and install that. So. Yeah, those costs could definitely come down if those components were um, mass manufactured, I'm sure. Thanks, Leah. Uh, Tina, uh, your one policy ask for um, heat pumps. Um, uh, systems that, well, control systems that customers can understand so they know what they're doing and they can get, get what they want and get the best performance out of their heat pump. Thanks, that sounds nice and uh, close to Leah's suggestion. So, um, Dara, over to you. Um, other than reforming the retail market, I think really it's that, you know, information and protection and advice for people, because that's how we're going to give people the confidence to get involved. OK, well, um, that's brilliant. I'm afraid that's all the time we've got um, in this afternoon seminar. So a huge thank you uh, to um, all of the speakers and thanks to all of the attendees. Um, I'm informed that this has been one of UKIRC's most popular um, seminars by attendance possibly reflecting uh, the times that we're in. So um, thanks to our speakers, thanks for attending.